All right, gentlemen, thank you for coming, sticking around for the uh, second half of our master certification training. What we're going to focus on now is our hydronic side. Um, feel free, as before, to ask any questions uh, whenever you need to at will. Just go ahead and raise your hands up, and we'll ask them as they come through. I may ask you to just wait on a pair of minutes if I know it's something we're going to get. Uh, get going on down through the training a little bit more. SpacePack has a line of air to water heat pumps. So a heat pump and a chiller are the same thing. However, in Maine, we're going to refer to it as a heat pump. In Florida, we're going to refer to it as a chiller, right? It does both functions very well, but generally we discuss it and we, we uh, talk about it as its primary focus, its primary use. If we're using it here, we could use it just as much for heat pump as chiller, but just if I bounce back and forth between those two terms, just keep in mind they're the same, they're the same item. How do they work, right? We've got a unit that sets outside, it's a refrigerant based unit, and it heats up or it cools water. That being said, in heating mode, what do we have? We have a unit outside with a compressor and <coughs> a condenser, our evaporator coil, refrigerant runs in one direction, right? The same way we make air conditioning, the same way an air to air heat pump either heats or cools the coil down, we do basically the same thing, except our gas runs through a heat exchanger uh, that's also with water, okay? So we have two different types of heat exchangers. One's a plate heat exchanger on one of our units, and the other one is uh, more like a shell and tube type heat exchanger. For argument's sake, the system runs one direction. We have a reversing valve here with refrigerant going one, hot gas goes through the plate heat exchanger, the plate heat exchanger, water comes then again in and out, heating water. In cooling mode, the exact same thing happens, but opposite. It's really that simple. When I say we have a high efficiency electric boiler that sets outside, we have a high efficiency electric boiler that sets outside. Okay? It's not voodoo magic. It's nothing crazy. Once we get inside with it, we're hydronic. We're pumping and piping warm water hot water or cool water, right? So why is this an option, right? We, one of the reasons is we don't have any refrigeration, any refrigerant in the condition space. A lot of times, some of the conditions will not allow it. Some people will not allow it. I don't want high pressure refrigeration lines in my house, in the walls, you know? Something that could uh, eclipse 500, 600 PSI at times, depending on the running conditions the volume of refrigerant in our systems because they're small, right? We got everything, we're not, we're not separating our condenser um, compressor and our condensing coils, everything is in that unit. So inherently we're gonna use 25 plus or so less refrigerant uh, than a conventional DX system. They come pre-packaged, they're mono block units. So you don't need to charge anything refrigerant wise for these units when they show up, okay? Inherently, if there is an issue, if there is a refrigerant issue, it's something we're gonna be able to handle because maybe uh, there was a leak or maybe a Schrader valve leak or something. But 99 times out of 100, when they show up on site, they are ready to go. You pipe them and power them and they'll run. The outdoor chiller or heat pump runs independent of the indoor blower, which we'll talk about. We have better humidity control. So why would we have better humidity control when we deal with cool water? Any thoughts? Because if we're looking to remove humidity and not necessarily looking to drop the temperature, we can actually raise the water temperature, right? So we can, we can dehumidify better. If we're looking to dehumidify and not necessarily drop that temperature, we can dehumidify better with, say, 55 degree water or 60 degree water as opposed to a DX system, which is like, it's going to make it 47 degrees, 47 degrees, and we're, you know, you would get rid of that clammy cold feeling sometimes maybe in a basement or something. Oh, it's, it's 65 degrees in the basement, but it feels clammy, right? Because it's still damp, it's still humid in that basement. How do, you always get the question, how do our heat pumps, our chillers, uh, compare to a ductless split or any other air conditioning unit? What's their... EER, their energy efficiency rating, or their SEER. Air to water heat pumps do not have that kind of rating. 
what we do have is a COP, or coefficient of performance. And basically, that's heat output, BTUs per hour, and then divided by our electrical output, okay? COP, as easy as stated, says that I give you a dollar. Here is a machine. A one COP, or a COP of one, you give me one dollar of energy back, right? If uh, three uh, COP of two and a half means I'm going to give you a dollar for heat, and you're going to give me two dollars and fifty cents worth of heat back. Okay, electric resistance baseboard, uh, electric elements in a water heater, they are all a COP of one. Okay, electricity has always been dubbed the like a, a four-letter word. But for argument's sake, if you get electricity at the right price, electricity is 100% efficient, right? We take electricity and make it more than 100% efficient through our heat pumps. Green by nature, we say, uh, we use a 410A refrigerant, uh, high efficiency compressors. The heat pumps, they run quieter than conventional systems. You have multiple fans, uh, variable speed, uh, speed fans, Horizontal discharge, we're going to get into a fair amount more of that as we break it down. <clears throat> Why are we flexible? So we're flexible because we can take these units when installed properly, we can heat a home, we can dehumidify a home, and we can cool a home with potentially the same system, depending on loads and, and uh, application. So we're perfect for zoning. What did we say before about our uh, air handler-wise uh, or DX system. We have a lot of things to worry about with zoning, right? We want to make sure we don't want to freeze, we want to have enough air. Well, if we decide to take our air handler, like we saw before, that has a hot, uh, a chilled water coil in it, and we want to run 47 degree water through there, we could run that through all day, whether there's one zones or five zones on it, it's never going to get any colder than 47 degrees. It's very easy to set your temperature and know exactly what you're dealing with. No fluctuation. <clears throat> Hydronic-wise also, Who's, who's done some boiler work? Okay? So the same thing, we've got a boiler. Whether we use a buffer tank or not, we've got a low loss header, we come across to our manifold. Every one of those circulators is a zone, right? We can do the same exact thing here, but we can also do it with chilled water. So that zone, that fan coil that's getting warm water, can also get chilled water. Have to insulate the pipes and we'll talk about that, but it gives you that flexibility. Even on the biggest houses, everybody wants a zone. And what's another way to save energy? If you're not in the room, turn the thermostat up or down, depending on the, uh, the condition, right? Depending on the outside temps. This basically gives us a layout of a really basic air to water heat pump setup, okay? We have our solstice extreme outside, we have two heat pumps. One that is designed gearing towards more cooling and one that's geared more towards low temperature heating, okay? This unit that's pictured here is our unit that's geared more towards cooling. We always, 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 99% of the time, couple our buffer, our heat pump with one of our buffer tanks. We're gonna get into the buffer tank a little bit more later, but basically, we saw on a slide previous, it said that the heat pump works independent of the inside system. The only thing that that heat pump cares about is the temperature of that tank. And if we're in cooling mode and I want my tank at 45 degrees, that's the only thing that cares about. It's going to make sure. We think about this is the battery and this is the charger. We're always going to make sure that that thing is ready to go so that one of these small fan coils or the larger fan coil call for cooling, that temperature is going to be set up there and ready to go. Heating. If we're in heating season, we're going to maintain that buffer tank on, on a heating temperature. Maybe it's 125 degrees. Maybe it's 100 degrees. Right? Low temperature heating. So you kind of see, once you get out of that buffer tank, you can do whatever you want. Now, some of you may be thinking, but since the camera's on, you're shy. You're like, hey, why are you, you got a radiant floor here. We're not going to pump any cold water through that. Well, no, but you know what? I bet you there's a zone valve down there that's not going to turn on because you have a heating-only thermostat in that room. So we can blend these systems together so that only certain areas need the cooling. We can still use the same structure of the system together, but only have certain uh, emitters call on at certain times to condition individual rooms. Why water works? Again, because it's flexible. We have an ease of zoning. 
Water carries more BTUs. You can integrate with existing hydronic solar and geothermal systems, which has been huge. We've got some projects where we've got uh, uh, photovoltaic solar, PV solar in the yard. We've got water solar on the roof. They got ex they got tanks down in the basement and and a boiler and our heat pump setting outside. So whatever time, and, and you think you know, it, it acts almost like oh my god, they must be so busy. Um, but at the end of the day. They're using whatever it is uh, would be the most efficient for that exact time. You know, I've got some pictures in what's coming up where contractor put in our units outside and put 900 gallons of storage in the basement. I'm talking about water storage. There's three 300 gallon buffer tanks. So when the sun's out and his PV solar is making him money, he's heating up that water. And he's heating up that water to 125 degrees, I think it was. When the night falls and the radiant falls, which was a design temperature of about 97 degrees, it sips off of that 900 gallons all night long. Drops the level of those tanks down to not even 100 degrees by the time the night goes, right? Guess what, the next morning, I know I've got it on a timer, it's gonna turn those heat pumps back on and heat the tanks up during the day when the sun's back out again. So using virtually no uh, fossil fuel type energy. So <clears throat> what water temperature will work? We always say if you can heat with lower water temperature, what temperatures are we going to use? Floor heating, bare. We can see that's that 80 to 110 degrees. That's, that's slab on grade stuff. That's shop stuff. You won't want any hotter than that, right? Where's the sweet spot? The sweet spot is that 120 degrees. With that 120 degrees, what can we do? We can use our air handlers. We can use panel radiators. Ceiling, wall heating, under floor, tube and plate, above floor, tube and plate, tin slab, and covered heating slab. Now, it just so happens that that's a really sweet spot for our heat pumps to create that water temperature. Right? We, may, we create up to about 130 degrees water temperature, but we could say we're going to set our buffer tank at maybe 120 or 125, so we're ready to go for any one of those applications. So anytime we're dealing with that water temperature as opposed to 180, okay, we always get the question, well, can I, can I put this in where my boiler is? Probably not. Because standard baseboard is based on what? 180 degree water. For argument's sake, it's 600 BTUs a foot at 180 degree water. You can run 120 degree water there, but I bet you're gonna be 250 or 300 BTUs a foot instead, and you're probably not gonna cool the place, or I'm sorry, heat the place. But just the same, if it's designed and set up correctly, no problem heating that same house with 120 degree water. You just have to have the correct <coughs> humidity. Do you have a question? Yeah, because on the other slides I've seen it, it says you uh, it heat domestic water, domestic hot water. Yep. So we generally won't have these units be the sole domestic hot water provider because generally you're going to want 120 degree domestic water or higher. We can use them to help supplement with a plate heat exchanger. There'll be a couple slides of that coming up that kind of breaks that down a little bit more. Okay. Um, sometimes folks have put them in line with a, with a plate heat exchanger because if we go outside with water, remember, we're going to want to uh, add um, antifreeze to the system. Right? We put a plate heat exchanger and maybe we use that 120 or 130 degrees to, to start to heat that electric water heater or start to heat another you know, heater, whatever we're using, whether it's a, uh, an indirect or, or something. Remote location. So remember the, the conversation before about my education? This is still that same job. So we <coughs> installed these two units way away. It was, it's actually like 150 feet from, from that house. <coughs> uh, insulated lines underground, pumps on the inside, came out to the outside units and went back in. So you're limited really only by your pumping abilities. You could have this unit a heat pump or a chiller unit set next to the house, or you can have it set away from the house, right? <clears throat> so our Solstice series of heat pumps, our SCM series, are the ones designed for primary cooling, right? They'll deliver cooling temperatures down to negative 20 outside ambient, okay? We can't see it from here, well, actually, yes, you can. On that brick building across the street, there's a unit up there, an SCM unit, that cools our server room year-round for the offices across the street. 
So a little bit of information on this unit. They come in uh, really the 060, the 036 we recently discontinued. They, there was just no need because each one of these units has two compressors. So the five ton has two two and a half ton compressors. So it's got a little built in redundancy for that. One inch NPT connections in and out. It gets piped. Um, relatively big. We're going to touch base when we uh, when we get to turn them on and make them run out out in the uh, in the lab area. So what's our output, right? What can we do? Our heating capacity. Now our heating capacity is at uh, on this chart particularly is at 47 degrees outside ambient. When I said these are more designed for the cooling application, they still do heat because they're heat pumps. They're reverse, reverse cycle chillers, reverse cycle heat pumps, but um, they're not designed for low temperature heating outside. Okay? In a heating capacity at 47 degrees, that unit will provide 52,000 BTUs of, of 125 degree water temperature. I'm sorry, 120 degree water temperature. Our cooling capacity, it'll deliver 48,000 BTUs. 48,000 BTUs of cooling. And we come down, we look, flow is everything, right? We're going to talk about flow like 400 times this afternoon. GPM, we need between 10 and 12 GPM flow through those units, through those heat exchangers. Okay? And look at our amp draw. We're in the, the 25 to 30 amp range. Okay? Two rotary compressors. Our cooling data is delivering 44 degree water at a 95 degree outside ambient. We're still doing that. Now look at our COP, right? So our heating COP, it's up over 265 when it's 47 degrees out, which means you're getting a pretty darn good return on your money. A little more elaborate layout here of our outputs. And we look at the bottom chart here for the 060. If we're dealing on the heating side and we're making 120 degree water and it's 17 degrees out, we're going to make 28,000 BTUs of that. If it's 47 degrees out, we can make 52. So you see there may be a point on here where we're going to be like, okay, we're going to use this until the outside ambient temperature gets below freezing. Then we're going to transition off and we're going to use a, a gas boiler or we're going to use another form of heat. Right? With cooling, whether we're doing 42, 44, or 47 degrees delivered water temperature and our outside ambient temp is 100 degrees, we're 105, we're still delivering 39,000 BTUs. If it's normal, like 82 to 90, we're in the 50 to 60,000 BTU range, right? So that's something to keep in mind. Flexibility, capacities, when you look at our COPs, right? Right over here, we're at a three COP. We don't really ever drop below about a, a 1.6. So for argument's sake, with electric being that bad four letter word, we're, we're making money on our investment. Of, of dollar to dollar as far as energy's costs. We want about 30% glycol mixture in these systems, you know, in that loop that runs uh, throughout the system, no more than 30. Uh, 30 usually gets you down to about negative 20 plus or so. There are frost protection built into our equipment uh, based on uh, temperatures. So uh, just a little glycol chart. <clears throat> our SCM series has true two-stage operation built-in redundancy because we've got the two compressors, two evaporator coils, and two completely independent refrigeration circuits that run through the common heat exchanger. Flow switches, kind of a miserable picture here, but how do we, how do we know we've got enough flow? It's really easy. There's a little paddle in there, and it's enough flow. It's either enough flow or it's not enough flow. So we know we have enough flow. It's on the outlet side of the system, so we know uh, after it's gone through all the system, the biggest thing you can imagine, right, if we've got that unit sitting next to the house, or we've got it like in the picture uh, from my education, where it was 150 feet away, you can think that we're probably going to use two different circulators for that application, right? If we've got to pump it that much more distance and there's still pressure drop across our coil on our heat exchanger, we're going to need to, to pipe uh, and pump appropriately. Corral controller. Uh, we have a corral controller on both of our units. Relatively user-friendly, we can walk you through just about anything. You can change water temperatures, you can change defrost settings, you can change uh, just about anything you could ever need through this control in our normal parameter settings. A couple of the things that come up when you see it, um, alarms, which we don't like to see, but it happens every now and then. It'll let you know if we're in heating or cooling mode. 
The NCM series also has an immersion well heater in the heat exchanger. What that'll do is if the water temperature gets too low because, hey, you know what, we shut this off when it gets cold, we are going to uh, kick over to maybe an oil boiler or a propane boiler. This unit gets too cold outside, it's gonna turn on that element for one, and it's gonna turn on our circulator, and it's gonna circulate that warm water from inside out just to prevent any kind of potential freezing. It's gonna let you know if we're in defrost, we got a fan running or pump running or the compressor running. Our different stages that our heat pumps could be in, heating, cooling, defrost, electric boost heat, heating freeze protection, and electric heat freeze protection. <coughs> The wiring, right, looks a little ominous when we take the cover off out in the lab area. You'll be like, wow, that's a lot of wires. And it is a lot of wires, but the cool thing is these units are super efficient and pretty dumb at the same time. And the fact that we need them to, we're gonna send them a signal to turn on or off, and we're gonna send them a signal to be in one position or the other for that three-way valve. It's either gonna be in a heating position, cooling position, on or off. And those are just end switches. Those are just end switches, nothing super fancy. A lot of sensors we've got going on, um, but uh, just on or off. Our power coming in, our power coming in <coughs> comes on L1, L2, <coughs> our pump out. So our pump, we're gonna discuss about it more, the pump that goes between our unit and our buffer <coughs> tank is controlled by the heat pump itself, controlled by the chiller, right? We won't, that way, when it's needed for frost protection or when it's needed for temperature in the tank to raise or lower it, it's gonna control it on its own. We've got power coming in here for our 3KW heater as well. Horizontal discharge on our unit, again, this is our SCM unit. It allows for many different installation applications. No necessarily, no raised platform required uh, for snow load or things like that. With remote location options, <clears throat> we can time side by side, we can do them pointing away from each other. We generally wouldn't point them into the other. Now, why wouldn't we do that? If we're in heating mode, what kind of air blows out of the top of your condenser outside? Cold. Okay. If we're in cooling mode, what type of air? Hot. Hot. Okay. So if we're in heating mode and we're pumping out cool air and we're using air to water heat pumps, we're using the temperature in the air to make more temperature, and we are actually blowing either too hot of air or too cold of air into the back of the other unit, they'll work, but this unit's gonna work really good and this one's not gonna work quite as well. So we wanna make sure there's plenty of airflow associated with, this, with these units. They can be installed just about anywhere. This was part of that 120 foot house that I mentioned before. This is the end of it, um, two five ton units. Piped them inside, we'll see some pictures of that a little bit later. Can we put multiple units, right? We looked at our SCM and we said, geez, you know, maybe 50,000 BTUs at 30 degrees is not gonna cut it. Can we use, can we put multiple units together? We absolutely can put multiple units together. As a matter of fact, you bet we can. Now, five units here, this was a church. It had one 25-ton chiller. I think this was in Maryland. It had one 25-ton chiller. They needed cooling. I don't know, I haven't checked the price tag on a 25-ton chiller, but I can imagine it's relatively expensive, right? So they said, geez, we'll pass the plate a few more times, we'll get some more donations, and they started buying heat pumps, our five-ton units, okay? So now they've got enough to cool it when the place is full, and they have the redundancy to, guess what? Shut them off when we don't need to. So they have a, we have a control that would stage those, but their, their maintenance person that's there, he takes care of it. He's like, you know what? If it's a full Sunday, we'll put on four units. If not, we'll do two or we'll use one, right? They all pipe into that same manifold system that the old children used. Some bigger projects like that, I mean, look at the redundancy, the, the availability for redundancy on some of these units. And again, why would we do something like that? Uh, this particular application, they were in banks of a certain amount, instead of having multiple big chillers on there, uh, it gave the redundancy. So even if there was an issue uh, with one, it, it, uh, the other ones were there to take over. We've been getting a lot of traction on these. Think about it, right? Even if you had a, a smaller chiller, a, a 10 ton or a 15 ton chiller in the city, 
and you had to get a crane, and you had to close the road down, and you had to get a crane at $500 an hour. It cost money to shut the road down. It cost money to get the crane. It cost to get that unit to pick it up and put it down, right? Our unit's at 400 pounds a piece. They could go right in the service elevator. If we had to move it up a flight or two of stairs, two uh, good-sized people could absolutely do that. Right? That's where we get some of that flexibility and some of that traction from. This home was out in, uh, this is actually Dick Wolf's house, the, the guy that, um, Law and Order franchise guy, yep. So uh, this is his home. Uh, they had a different chiller in there, uh, set of chillers that didn't work out, thank goodness, and uh, brought ours in, went up there, uh, did a little work on it, and now the system uh, works quite fine. I had a little a little piping issue, uh, a little return and supply was, was mixed up, but uh, nevertheless, we, we took care of it. Had four inch uh, copper header mains outside and all over the place. That's quite, uh, quite the job, to say the least. Many systems are multi, uh, multiple units, just a couple of the two or three tied together. And again, they can either be tied together daisy chain style, so this, when one comes on, they'll all come on. Or we have a staging control that'll say, okay, this one's gonna come on. If we don't hit our set point within two minutes, we'll call this one on. If we still don't hit our set point within two minutes, this one will come on and so on and so forth. Right? So there's a way to tie them in all together. It will as well monitor, monitor the runtime. It won't change every single time to what number one is. Let's say this one gets two hours of runtime. Once that gets two hours of runtime, then it'll give this one two hours of runtime. And then it'll so on and so forth, right? So it won't uh, alternate the units every single time it turns on, but once it gets a specific amount of runtime predetermined. The other application here, we've got multiple units installed. The flagship unit that we have, right, for heating is our Solstice Extreme. <clears throat> this is where, this is the unit that's really made the most traction uh, over the last two years. Uh, it's, they've been out, um, I don't mean to kind of downplay it, air to water heat pumps have been out for about seven years. Like the, the picture of the project that I showed you a long ways away, that was seven years ago that I put those, those units in. And they're still running great today, fantastic unit. Our, the, the goal for our unit here, for our low ambient heat pump, we call it our LEHP, is to deliver higher water temperatures at lower outside ambient temperatures, right? <clears throat> it's harder because we're getting our temperature from the air, and the colder the air gets, the less temperature we can get from it. What do we have here for standard features, right? We've got 64,000 BTUs of available delivered temperature at 47 degrees. We also have 3.5, 3.3 tons of cooling at 95 degrees. Again, we're user-friendly here uh, on the side of water. Easy installation. We've got some outdoor reset. We've got modulating fan uh, and low ambient freeze protection, things like that. What will this unit do? This is a funny slide because it's nice and small, right? But we've got this unit rated down to negative 5 outside ambient. So at negative 5 outside ambient, it will deliver 40,000 BTUs of 130-degree water. Okay. 40,000 BTUs of 130 degree water. So it's gonna make that buffer tank inside 125 degrees, because generally if we're making 130, we won't try to make 130 inside. We'll have a couple of degrees differential, right? So we're able to overshoot it a little bit. Now keep in mind, if our load eclipses that 40,000 BTUs, like we've got a, an air handler like I have in my house, we have an air, I have an air handler, and I also have one of these heat pumps, okay? And it ran, it's running all year long for all of my heat, but I oversized my air handler, right, to accommodate the lower uh, water temperatures. But in doing that, there comes a point when it gets so cold out that the load of that 510 air handler comes on, it's over 40, I'll, I'll drain that thing right down, right? Because it just won't make that water temperature because the load is too much load. And at which time we have some options that we can incorporate um, resistant element heaters in our buffer tanks and things of that nature. At 110 degree water, uh, we can deliver 37,000 BTUs. If it's 47 uh, of 130 degree water, we're almost 70,000 BTUs of, del of uh, delivery. Okay, that's at 130. And the kicker, right, we look at our COPs over here, and we're, we're 2.3, 2.7, we're over three COP, okay? My heat pump at the house, I have an LEHP, I have a 30 gallon buffer tank inside, and I have an air handler, and I had, everything in my house is electric. And I live in New York State, and I'm just about 
through the winter here, about $260 electric bill. Now, $100 of that's there all the time. So I'm basically heating, running that heat pump for less than $150 a month. Okay? And I'm keeping it way warmer than I'd like to. Um, thank my girlfriend for that. But um, at about 67, 68 degrees all the time, you know, in a 1970s ranch house. But it was size right and designed right. So how do we get all this energy, right? How do we get this low temperature? We get these efficiencies, right? We have an enhanced vapor injection compressor. So it gives us that 30% better heating performance. We got energy efficiency and, and much more reliability. Copeland compressor, right? Everybody's heard of Copeland compressor. Little, little different breakdown, all right? If we're dealing with um, <clears throat> our cooling capacity, remember we, only, we have a little reduced cooling capacity here, but generally if we need more heat because we're up north, we're not going to need quite so much cooling load. And for that, um, again, our COPs are, are, are quite high. Again, minimum, maximum 10 to 12 GPM flow through these units, right? We want to have flow. We're going to have about a 10 degree water delta. So if our water temperature is 60 degrees coming in and it's 70 degrees going out, we're not going to take 60 degree water and make it 110. It's got to go through the system multiple times to make that happen. Uh, glycol again, uh, wiring again is very similar. I love these slides. It really makes you think about how your eyes are. Um, but just the same, you've got 230, 40 volts in, uh, and then uh, we control our circulator pumps as well just from that unit. There's a couple of pictures of applications, right? So this was Maine. Obviously, there's rocks in Maine. And we're like, well, how are we going to do this? Might look a little... Uh, a little cheesy, but it, it absolutely functions and it, and it works fantastic for that application. This job came from uh, down in Connecticut. Um, really nice house. It was on a floodplain after Hurricane Sandy, I believe. And everything in this area, there could be no electronics on new builds uh, any lower than nine feet above sea level. So that level right there is nine feet above sea level. Go inside the house, all the outlets were up. There was nothing in the basement. It had to be up here, nine feet above sea level. So, uh, another application John Sigenthaler. Anybody heard of John Sigenthaler? Okay, hydronic guy. Uh, this is his office uh, out in western New York. Has an LEHP running a radiant slab as well as one of our hydronic pylon units. Just another application. Um, this one is in New York State. Another LAHP to running um, running their handler inside. This unit here is actually at a contractor in Boston. Up on the roof, obviously, hasn't blown over yet, so that's good. And uh, it's basically doing the heating and cooling of his shop slash office. One of the first beta sites that we ever had, um, this was just doing a uh, radiant slab. And so snow is not an issue, you said. So snow is not an issue. What would become an issue is if the snow built up to here. Now, generally speaking, these units go, if the conditions are right, and you're pulling moist air across a warm coil, but it's getting cold, things are going to freeze. And when the water, when the, the pressure on the refrigeration circuit gets to a certain pressure, a certain point predetermined in our control, it's going to go into a mode of defrost, which basically is going to stop making heat. It's going to run the system backwards, which is going to make the outside coil on the unit warm, melt the ice, and then it's going to go back to its uh, normal function of heating. The idea is that then when it defrosts, and it will defrost, the ice will melt and the water will run, you want to have it a little, uh, most of them you'll see now they'll be up a little bit. People like to try to get them up a little so that when the water does run out, it doesn't turn to complete ice right underneath it. It's got a heated drain pan underneath it so that nothing actually freezes inside the unit. Once it gets outside, it, it may absolutely freeze. So this was a, a project called the New School in Maine. I can't remember exactly where in Maine, but these units, there's a couple other air to water units behind that shall remain nameless because they didn't work. And they're not ours, so maybe I should talk about them. But nevertheless, our units ran last winter, not this winter we're in now, last winter for like, there was a stand about two and a half to three weeks where it was 20 degrees below zero. Wind chill, this is on an old Air Force base up there. And they never shut off. Those two units never shut off. It kept the school 
from freezing and kept it at about 64 degrees. Okay? It was only making 70, 80 degree water out here because that's all it could do was negative 20. Right? They had an independent monitoring company monitoring it the whole time. Uh, this was kind of like a prototype test site. And they're like, geez, these things are running. They're, they're making enough heat to keep that building from freezing. They're making enough heat to uh, you know, keep school open, so to speak. Right? It's about a 6,000 square foot building. And this had, uh, you can't see it. I should have taken a picture of it. It had a 3,000 gallon underground uh, storage tank, thermal storage tank. It's pretty wild. Another picture of it, of the application. Really nice work uh, done. One of the things that I can't stress enough when we start getting into to pumping and piping is insulation. When we're dealing with chilled water piping, when you think you have it insulated enough, you have to go back and re-insulate and insulate some more. Okay, and I'll explain that a little bit more uh, as we move through. Here's the application that I mentioned earlier with the three 300-gallon uh, tanks in the basement. Uh, you can't see it, but there's a uh, solar panel in the back. And this gentleman had, had solar before it was cool, right? Before solar was cool, he had, he had solar. And somehow he's grandfathered into some program where he had a ridiculous amount of electrical credit, $30,000 plus with his electrical company, right? Because he kept feeding back power. In fact, his son and daughter, who don't even live there, they live in another town, but have the same provider, don't have to pay for electricity either because they're running off of his credit. So he said, why not put some electrical units here? Right? I got all this electrical credit. I can run for a long time. We put these units in. He's like, I'm still making money because they're so efficient. The way the system's set up, it runs during the day when, that, when those uh, panels are making the most electricity. It's heating up that 900 gallon and then skating on it all night long. So those are our those are our engines, so to speak. Those are the chargers for the battery, right? Our, our heat pumps outside. Um, you want to take a, a couple of minutes, or are you good? I know this is a whole lot more boring than the other stuff. I could do a cartwheel or something if you want. Right, on, right on the thing with a, with a red pen. I don't want to knock on my microphone. You know, it's okay. professional stuff here. <laughs> so we get into our air handlers, all right, and we have different emitters to help handle and work with this low temperature heating and cooling. <clears throat> this looks familiar, right? So our J series air handler, when we were talking there was DX before, we have the same exact air handler with a, chill, with a coil inside a water coil, which could be used for heating and cooling in these applications, right? Heating and cooling. Again, surprise, surprise, right? They come in three sizes, the same 2430, 3642, and 4860 from that two, ton all the way up to five ton capacity. Mm. Virtually exactly the same size uh, with the same uh, benefits. The same uh, field conversion for 110 volts. The same, uh, well, obviously we're heat pump compatible, but <clears throat> we still have a big fat six row hydronic coil. Our float switch, our condensate trap, all of that stuff uh, still comes into play. Again, not to reiterate too much, but our air handler would go in that part of the system. We also have some other emitters, right? How are we going to get this chilled water, this heated water, to condition the rooms if we're not using a radiant tube or something? We have fan coil units. That's absolutely what it looks like in a ductless split head. But what sets that apart is that it is a hydronic ductless split head. So we're going to pipe hot water or cold water there and either heat or cool condition that space. Some of the capacities, we have three sizes, a six of 15 and an 18,000 in theory, right? So our cooling capacities are a half, three quarter, and one ton. But for heating, right now we're heating with, if I'm not mistaken, 120 degree water. And 120 degree water, we can deliver over 11,000 BTUs with our smallest unit, okay? That'll take care of a pretty decent sized room. If we wanna go up to our biggest unit, which is the same physical size, it's just the coil inside gets greater, and the fan speeds change a little bit, we're up over 20,000 BTUs delivered. And that's at that 120 degree water, I believe. Uh, our maximum operating temperature on these things is 160 degrees. Right? We wouldn't want to go any more than that. You can see, right, <clears throat> the devil's in the details. GPM, GPM. One of the things to remember, always remember, like, like your name, you want to remember this. If I'm going to heat, 
my design temperature to heat with is 120 degrees. Something happens, air filters get plugged, I don't know what's going on, and the water temperature delivering is 120. You're going to still heat that room, and it'll just take longer, right? If you design a system to cool with chilled water, and you want a design temperature of 50 degrees, or let's say 45 degrees, but you deliver 50 degrees, you will not cool that room. It's going to come to a point, and that's all it's going to give you. Okay, very, very important. When we say we want a gallon and a half, two gallons, two and a half GPM per unit, you give it two and a half GPM per unit, okay? Same thing we talked about with the coil before. The only time you really deliver too much cooling or too much pumping power is when you start wasting energy when your circulator is grossly oversized. So very important. Uh, if having not enough flow is, is just as bad, if not worse, as having not the correct temperature. Here's our unit again. Um, looking at this, uh, what I said before, those other numbers were based on 140 degrees. So if we were delivering 120 degrees, our smallest unit would still do 8,000 BTUs of heating, and our largest unit would do uh, 14,000. Now if we went up to 160 degree, our maximum water temperature, now we use 14,000 and 25,000 BTUs respectively. Our cooling, depending on our water temperature, be at 45, 47, or 50. If it's 45 degrees, our big unit will do a little over a th uh, one ton of cooling for that room. Okay, think about it. There's nothing uh, overly fancy. We've got a, a wireless remote. We put it on cooling, and there it goes. If you didn't know there was water running through it, you would think it's a refrigerant-based duckle split head. Yep, as long as the water temperature doesn't go too high. So we get a lot of play with, even on a system that's got nothing to do with space pack, say you've got a three season room, and that three season room, that radiant in the floor is only gonna give you 20 to 25 BTUs a square foot. Well, three season room, you could turn into a four season room by taking that same water temperature, putting it through one of our fan coils that's meant for lower water temperature, and go ahead and add in another six to 8,000 BTUs to that room. I'm assuming that you still have a drain hole. Yep, yep, it still condensates, it's a drain pan, everything is the same, except for instead of copper lines going for a line set, we're going to have, uh, depending on the run length now, because remember we want to maintain the correct flow, it could either be uh, half inch PEX lines or three quarter inch PEX lines. Generally, I always err to the side of a larger PEX line, a larger uh, supply line or return line will allow you to run a smaller circulator generally, right, because we don't have so much restriction to overcome. Saw this one already, huh? Little dimensional drawing. Again, all three of the units are the same size. Um, I would I would equate them to the technology of the five year ago duckless split. They're not as fancy as some of the new ones. When you turn it on, and oh, the doors automatically open, and this and that happens, right? This will give you good heating and good cooling with water. <clears throat> we also have what we call our thin wall. The last unit was our high wall. This unit is a thin wall. Again, just a wall-mounted fan coil unit that's going to go down on the ground now. We're not going to have it up in the air on the wall. We're going to have it down. It'll still be mounted on the wall, but lower. You can see this application. It could be just up a little bit, um, or it could be mounted on the floor. Depending on the unit, we have five different size units. The width and the height stay the same. The length is what changes. They go from a little over two feet to five feet. And if we're talking about 120 degree water, we can go on our smallest unit, 4,600 BTUs, and on our larger unit is 17,800 BTUs. Right? If we pump up that water temperature to 160 degrees, which is our maximum water, allowable water temperature, we get all the way up to 32,000 BTUs delivered to a room. So if we, th and again, this is heating and cooling. So how can we heat and cool a space? We can absolutely do it this way. Okay, we've had systems put in where, okay, I really like the radiant, I like the radiant, okay, well, radiant would be first stage, second stage is a fan coil, plus we also have first stage of cooling involved with it, right? All different many ways to, to skin the cat, so to speak. That has uh, sort of air filtration, but does the uh, high wall have it? Yeah, the, the same kind of little filters that you pull out on a ductless split. Yeah, uh, we don't have the HEPA filter thing in there, but the 
lift them up the stream. I'll show them when we get outside. They're, they're uh, by no means nothing super fancy, but I don't believe anybody's are at the moment. There's no murder filters going in. It's not the split anywhere. So again, um, our units are the same physical uh, height and uh, depth. It's the width that changes. You can either mount them on the floor or uh, stand them up on a little floor stand. Air will go in here and blow out the top. Half inch uh, water connections, basically the same connection we're going to use for a laboratory faucet are the connections that we're going to use here. So readily available. Our heat pumps, chillers, are also a great match for what? Our low temperature needs. And what are our low temperature needs besides our fan coils? Anybody's radiant, right? Again, we're just making really good efficiency outside and we're chilling down water and we're heating up water. So we can use, we can see where our temperature ranges is. Generally, we're going to use, uh, we could use radiant wall, we could use radiant ceiling, and we can use radiant floor, all in these different temperature variations. Piping and uh, options. So generally speaking, right, we're almost always going to use, my recommendation is to always use, I'm going to set this down if I lose it. Tell me where it is. We're almost always going to use a buffer tank. Space pack has buffer tank. Does anybody use a buffer tank for anything else? Somebody raise their hand just so it looks good for the camera. All right, cool. Wood. Thank you. Wood, right? So why do we use buffer tanks? There's a couple different reasons. We use buffer tanks for thermal storage. We use buffer tanks for hydraulic separation, right? Dissimilar pumping. Okay, we've got a, a few different reasons that we can use that. SpaceVac has a stainless steel buffer tank, a really well-priced stainless steel buffer tank with a 10-year warranty. I can promise you that if you do any kind of chilled water applications, you want a stainless steel buffer tank. You do not want a carbon steel buffer tank. You want a stainless steel buffer tank. Stainless steel buffer tanks, our size, they come in 26, 40, and 80 gallon. They're a completely empty four pipe buffer tank. But what do they do also have? Two immersion well elements in it. So what did I say? Sometimes things get too cold outside and the heat pumps can't quite keep up with it. If the water temperature drops below a predetermined amount, it will automatically call on these elements. Power those elements and add the potential of another 20,000 BTUs back to that tank. Okay? Now, keeping in mind some applications, some real real low load homes that are in the, the 10 to 15,000 BTU range, if things got real crazy, they could run the whole house just on those elements. And still with a COP of one, right? Because we're not wasting any energy, we're just dumping into that empty tank. So, <clears throat> try to do this, check my markers here. Oh, that's an ugly one. All right, we'll do it. So here's our buffer tank, right? How does this buffer tank work? We're going to have our heat pump over here, and we're going to have our system, maybe we're going to have air handler here, maybe we're going to have radiant loop here, okay, just for argument. How are we going to do this? You know what else? We're going to, it's going to get cold, so maybe we're going to do a boiler too, okay, maybe we're, we're going to run a, a wall on boiler. You know what else? You know what we should do? We're going to have some solar here too, right? So let's do some solar panels. Cool, right? Hold on, wait. There we go. Now everybody's happy. So we've got some solar panels associated with this also. We've got, <clears throat> we might as well be in heating mode, right? We're going to try, I'm going to try to stick with the colors, but I don't think it's going to happen. What happens with a buffer tank, right, is out of our heat pump, okay, we're going to try to main, we're going to set this at what? Let's set this at 130. 130 degrees. We're going to maintain our buffer tank, I don't know, at somewhere in the vicinity of uh, 120. Let's call it 125, right? Okay. For all of us technical people, I'm going to write not to scale on the top of this. So I don't get called out on anything. That unit, for a color on myself, move that one around the back. Only because we're on TV, guys. Only because we're on TV. 
<clears throat> we've got in and out, right? In and out. It's an open buffer tank. So here comes our manifold. This is coming out. It's going to be copper. The tappings on the 26 and 40 are inch and a half stainless steel, right? Stainless steel tank. And the tappings on the 80 gallon are two inch. Okay, two inch. So here's our inlet, right? So this is going to be going this way. We're going to pipe out of this. So here's our unit. We're going to come in, right? This is going to be our return. So we're going to come back over and go into the unit there. Where's the heat exchanger? So the heat exchanger for the difference between the refrigeration and the water you're talking about? Yeah. That's in the unit here. Oh, okay. There's a stainless steel plate heat exchanger in there. And then what about for the antifreeze loop into the tank? Essentially, the entire system is going to have antifreeze unless you put a plate heat exchanger in the loop. Oh, okay. Yep. And so if you put a plate heat exchanger in this loop, the plate heat exchanger would be on the system side. Oh. You follow me? Yeah. Yep. What well, we, because, you so, said, well, couldn't you do it on existing heat pump was outside? Could you do this for that? Nope. You didn't want to heat, antifreeze your boiler? And right. So the problem with that is that this unit is a four ton compressor and it needs flow and it needs water. And it will heat the water up or cool it down so fast it will actually short cycle the unit. So we want water associated with these. We want them to run. These units run much more efficiently when they run for 15 minutes as opposed to two or three or five. Right? We want that water volume there for them to be, you know, we know that every time a, you know, your, your high efficiency boiler starts up, you never put your, uh, uh, <clears throat> Your detector, your um, efficiency meter, I can't even think of what we're Analyzer. Going to call it. Analyzer, your combustion analyzer, my goodness. We never put that in and then start the unit up, right? Because what's going to happen? To, that's the un most unclean combustion it's going to have is on startup. Kind of the same way with electrical. We want it to come on, that's where you're going to get a little spike in electricity, and then it's going to settle down. And that's where we want it to maintain its like cruise control, so to speak, for your system. So what's going to happen here, right, is this water, if there's no call going on over here, this hot water, is going to come in and it's going to go right back out. Right? That's what it's going to do. Now, kind of doing this a little backwards. I'll just stick with red. Here's our manifold coming off also. Yeah. Anybody remember how many GPM we're going to run through there approximately? 2.5. Say that again? 2.5. No. Nope. 10 gallons. 10 to 12 GPM. Now, here's our high wall unit. I'm doing this just for you so you can be right. How many GPM are we going to run through our high wall unit? 2.5. Okay? So that might be the first unit that comes off. So here we come, 2.5 GPM to there. We come back out of here and go into our manifold again, right? The only thing that this cares about is the temperature in this tank. This unit's going to come on, and it's going to do what? It's going to start pushing some of this water back, right? And sucking some of it out here to go back. But what else is it going to do? Because we've got 10 to 12 GPM over here and 2 GPM on this zone. Some of this water is going to go right back to the outside unit. Some of this really hot water is going to come right here, go across, and right back directly out into the system. That's how, through that hydraulic separation, we're allowed, uh, gives us the ability to have very dissimilar flow rates, right? And still have the ability for everything to work in harmony. If we didn't have something for hydraulic separation, anybody that's been in the industry long enough to know is, if our manifold's not big enough and we've got 10 GPM and, and 1 GPM going, you will absolutely overpower that 1 GPM loop and not allow any water to go to it. Because it's going to be starving. You know, the, the big loop, the big motor is what will take over. Keeping that in mind, with a series of check valves, right, we can come in and tie into this with a boiler. 
You know, we can tie into it with a solar tech. So depending on the temperature, okay, we have a control we'll talk about. It's called the SSIC control. And based on outside air temperature, it will choose what we want it to do. So if we have our low ambient heat pump, and we know that we're going we're gonna to handle all our load, and you know what, until it gets down to zero. And I think at zero degrees, we're going to turn on our, our boiler, our oil boiler, our electric boiler. We're going to turn it on. So we have a control that's going to say, okay, you know what, we're going to shut this guy off, and we're going to turn the boiler on to maintain this buffer tank's temperature. Okay? Now here's the other thing. We've got an air handler. I might just get rid of the blue all together. We've got an air handler here, right? And a radiant zone that that might only be one GPM. This might be five GPM. All of those systems can run independently, all just feeding off this. When any one of those runs, and this temperature through our control, maybe we have a five degree differential built in, maybe we have it, leave it at five degrees. When that temperature in that tank, the sensor's right here in the middle, gets to 120 degrees, what's it gonna do? It's gonna turn on one of these forms of heat, right? Turn these on as the charger for this said battery. So depending on what we're doing, depending on uh, how the system is set up, it can be very basic. There's plenty of houses, there's two houses on the same street in Vermont that only use the LAHP, our air to water heat pump, for their sole form of heat. We like you to have a backup, whether your backup is elements in the buffer tank or some other form, right? An air electric of some kind. We are able to go ahead and really make, make these systems flexible, make them, if this isn't the most efficient thing to do today, we're gonna do this. And if this is more efficient than both of those on Wednesday, we're gonna do this. At the end of the day, uh, when I kind of said before to, to think outside of the box, this may seem pretty clouded, right? Like how is this clear as mud, right? Clear as mud. But this is 100% where certain parts of our industry are going. There is no question about it, okay? We're fortunate enough to be uh, industry leaders, if I, if I may say that, in the low ambient uh, air to water heat pump world because we've been around it. We, we've basically brought this market to uh, North America, okay? New England market is the fastest growing. The other place, Northern California, okay? Huge market for it there because you can really have that unit, that low ambient unit that handles your whole heating load and handles your cooling load, plus gives you all that flexibility. We definitely always want to use a buffer tank. Almost lost that clicker. It's right here. We want to have that buffer tank for the flexibility, for our hydraulic separation, for our thermal storage, right? It'll create longer run times and longer off times, which is what we want for things to be efficient. How do we decide? Generally about five gallons per ton will work. Uh, we want on our LHP unit, we want a minimum of 40 gallons. Is it a detriment to have more? Nope, only if it takes up too much room in the basement. You know, I spoke with a gentleman who had 900 gallons in his basement, okay? If you can put an 80 in, put an 80 in instead of a 40. It's just gonna be that much longer. You gotta think if we've got some of these zones that are small zones, and we've got 80 gallons of warm water sitting there ready to go that we built efficiently, you may satisfy a zone or two and never even call on your heating, the, the outside unit, right, our heat pump. So basic pumping, uh, this is what we have in our uh, installation manual. We're always gonna pump. Now remember, this circulator that handles from the buffer tank to the heat pump, that's controlled by the heat pump. That's gonna tell it when to come on. When that temperature drops, it's going to turn that on. It doesn't care what's going on up here. It doesn't care at all. Again, it's a boiler system. It's a low pressure system. It's 12 to 15 PSI, just like a boiler system, just like any other hydronic system. So we need expansion. We need water feed. Uh, potentially, we need glycol makeup systems, um, depending on uh, what's required in your area. So what exactly is a short fat header? Okay. 
So taking a couple steps back with our hydraulic separation. If we had, just for argument's sake, not sure, collect pipe size, just make sure I'm not contradicting anything on here. So say that's a two inch pipe. Well that two inch pipe, how many GPM can we get through there? About 20 GPM. What happens if every one of those come on and they're all five GPM loops? You, you're might, you might run out, right? Generally speaking, that doesn't mean that I'm gonna go up to two and a half inch copper, right? From a sizing standpoint, and anybody that's been in the business long enough, a lot of uh, inside and outside sales people that kind of help contractors lay things out, you basically design things for usually 60 to 70% of that full load, right? Or 60% of the whole system to call at one time. Because really the only time your system is gonna ever call 100% is on startup, or if for some reason it has been off due to, due to something, due to a power outage, and then all air handlers are gonna, are gonna come on. And keep in mind, even though uh, the air handler may say it's, uh, it's 60,000 BTUs, well, that doesn't mean it's gonna draw 60,000 BTUs the second it comes on. It's gonna be contingent upon our uh, incoming and outgoing air, right? So everything varies. But keeping in mind that if we had, if we had five units here that were all five GPM, and this was one inch copper, and we know we can only get five GPM through one inch copper, and two or three of those happen, what's gonna happen? Now this one might get five GPM, this one isn't gonna get it, and before you go down here, we, we basically used up all that water, and these units are gonna be starving. You might be able to pump two GPM through them barely, right? So it's important to have that, that same hydraulic separation is happening here the same way it does in, uh, in the buffer tank. A couple of little application photos. We're doing pretty good. Uh, our unit we have set outside. Another thing I'll make mention of uh, are circulators. Always pump, your circulator should always pump through the resistance, right? Always pump through the resistance. So it's a lot of old boiler stuff. It's like, oh, you had the old B and G 100, they were on the return side, blah, 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 blah. Put it on uh, your circulators, chilled water, warm water, our suggestion, our recommendation, and it's become relative industry standards now, to have your circulator push, right? Push through that resistance. Push through the resistance of our heat exchanger. Push through the resistance of our coils of our radiant. Heating mode, cooling mode, a couple different applications. Um, this kind of shows a little layout of how, through some motorized valves, right, we can use a boiler, and we can call on a boiler and run them at the same time. So our SSIC control has a cooling, uh, a heat pump only mode, a boiler only mode, and then a boiler health mode. So regardless of where we're at, generally speaking, running that LAHP, our low ambient heat pump unit, will be more efficient than firing up any fossil fuel. So what do we do? Let's fire up that buffer, that uh, heat pump first, every single time. And you know what? If it doesn't reach set point, if the temperature drops enough, we'll call on the boiler, and we'll have them both run together to reach that, that set point again. And then it'll shut off, and then when it calls again, it'll turn the heat pump on again. Because maybe that next time, the load is just so small that the heat pump can handle it, even though it's negative five outside. Solstice heat pump, space uh, units on the outside. Again, everything on the inside is hydronic. Flow rate is everything. Now this is a heating only application, right? Because we generally wouldn't run chilled water through panel radiators. It'd be really cool if you wanted to like soak things down a little bit, depending on your dew point. Plate heat exchangers. So these to me are the devil, right? Talked about that a lot. Because we need that water volume to run through these systems. There's been a few jobs, and we'll see a picture of it, where if if somebody is comfortable with using plate heat exchangers, they can be used, but they have to be sized 100% properly. And they have to be sized different for cooling than they do for heating, because the heat trans trans transfers differently than cooling does through a plate heat exchanger that's designed for heating transfer. And why do I say that? Because generally, there's a five to seven degree flow difference, right? So when I say, okay, we're gonna say, we're gonna run our outside unit at 130 degrees. If we know that we're gonna lose five to seven degrees in here, 
the most we're going to make that water in that buffer tank is 123 degrees, right? We want to be a little over that, so now we've just presented ourselves to the fact that our buffer tank is going to be 120. I know that uh, glycol, that antifreeze, people don't like it. Uh, just as some of the other things are in the industry, it's a way to get back in the door. It's a way to sell a service contract with an easy, okay, you're, uh, you're still at 35% glycol mixture, you're gonna be good for another year, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, right? Or, you know what, it's kind of getting diluted, you know, it's been a couple years, let's freshen it up a little bit. But it gets you in to see the systems. Um, I've never been a fan of, uh, you know, uh, out of sight, out of mind. You need to be uh, coherent, right? You need to be understanding of these systems when you put them in, because when you put something like this in, generally speaking, Joey HVAC down the road is not going to know anything about this, right? So they're going to come back to you, and you're going to want to be mindful of it, and you're going to want to just kind of keep things up to speed. And again, you don't go for a service contract for no money. That's part of it what you sell. And a lot of times, it's second nature for the customer to ask, um, now, do I need a service contract for this? Absolutely you do, and we can give you one by doing A, B, and C. How is that any better to put the heat exchanger on the opposite side of the buffer tank? So that would just keep the antifreeze out of the emitters. But you still have the differential in the tank. You would still have the differential, yep. So you still have to deal with that. Yep. So it's it's just that doing it this way keeps that uh, antifreeze here. My preference is if it has to be done. Because a lot of times you'd want to keep it out of the radiant floor, out of the zone valves and things like that. You could do it on the outside, the output of the uh, buffer tank. So you put it, you know, you put it over here. You know, this would come down. And here's our plate heat exchanger. Yeah. And you know, this would this could go out this way. This is meant to run on these ones. You know, and then but, but that's gonna catch you some temperature. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's what I'm that's when I when we start dealing with low water temperature. When you're already dealing with low water temperature, you start taking degrees away from that, you have to allow for that. And again, if it's sized correctly, that five, that six degrees you may lose could be the difference between that house reaching set point or not. So it's just something to be very mindful of. But having it on the heat exchanger where you have it, your preferred location there. Uh, this is not the preferred location, just so we're clear. Oh, I thought the I, I, I would prefer the that they're out in the dumpster and not on our system at all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but if if you were if there was somebody who was adamant about this, I would really like it to be on the inside of the system or on the system side of it. So that the buffer tank and the outside unit would be glycol. And at which point you can generally just say, listen, well, there's only about another three and a half gallons of water in the whole system, so what's the difference? We're not going to get any return by putting that in there, and it's going to run more efficiently. You know, um, the antifreeze like gasoline is going to find every tiny little thread that you didn't put any enough uh, tape or dope on or whatever for uh, for fittings, right? That's kind of one of those things. But I always use it as a tool to get back in the home every year. I need to go back in there because if there's a problem, something occurring, I want to catch it. I want to catch if the valve is leaking before it becomes all over the floor because they will call you on Saturday morning when you were not around. They're not gonna call you up. Well, we knew it was, it was leaking on Thursday at two o'clock, but we didn't figure out, you know what? It started, there's four drips now, so that's why I called you on Saturday morning, right? I would much rather prevent an issue than wait for one to happen, you know? So I use stuff like the um, changing air filters or monitoring the antifreeze as a selling point, as a way to get back in the house. You're not gonna sell them anything new, you're not gonna provide them any services unless you are in front of them. So here's an application. This was that 900 gallon in the basement with plate heat exchangers. Now, this works really well until it gets close to set point, right? So when it gets close to set point, we don't have the differential. Plate heat exchangers work really well if we're 100 degrees on this side and 140 on this side and we're trying to transfer heat back. The closer those two sides of a plate heat exchanger get, especially when we get within the that five to seven degrees, degrees of variance, right, from one side to the other, they don't work as well. So what will happen is when these units get close to set point, they'll short cycle four or five times. They'll go on and off, on and off, on and off, you know, over the course of 15 minutes. So does it 
does it successfully do what they were wanting to do and not, so you know, in this application, yeah, they've got 900 gallons, you just want to put, you know, 30 gallons of glycol in the system or 40 gallons of glycol, whatever it would, it would take to make uh, his 30%. Uh, Here's that picture. So they built a room around this um, and insulated the room. I can tell you when those tanks got to 125 degrees, the heat that they put off, it was like unbelievable. Yeah, just a wide open storage tanks. So this is the sauna. Yeah, it was it was something. They they uh, he built some walls and then blew some uh, blew some insulation. Another application you can see here, right? So we talked about domestic hot water and how we recommend it not to be the sole source of domestic hot water. Let's say we had an electric water heater, right? We had an electric water heater and we we then used a plate heat exchanger, right? Because maybe we're not, all we have to do is deliver 100 degree water to here because it doesn't take much for an electric water heater to drop down to the 80s. So when it drops down to the 80s, we can start pumping 100 degree here. We bring it up to 100 degree quicker. It's a whole lot less work that those elements got to do to bring it from 100 to 120. So we can use our system to supplement the hot water. Okay? It's generally not advised to use it as the sole purpose of domestic hot water. And if it is, it has to be designed that way. You have to know that you're not going to get 8 GPM of hot water out of the thing for 14 showers in a row. It's just not going to happen. You're going to get below the curve and it's not going to be able to keep up with that system. You know, if our design hot water temperature is 120 degrees, conceivably, yeah, we deliver 130, we can make it, we can make it happen until it gets under the curve. You know, um, and a lot of times you'll see like even indirect water heaters, um, we've a couple of people unfortunately dial in a couple of uh, indirect water heaters. Well, indirect water heaters, their BTU load is based on high temperature water. I don't know that any company, do you know of any company that makes a low temperature indirect storage tank? They're all based on high temperature water. It's the only way you're going to get your transfer and your recovery rate because we're trying to make 120 with 180. When we make 120 with 130, it doesn't work so well. It will eventually, but it'll never it'll never keep up. That's why we just recommend not to use it as that primary source. We can help it out, but we don't want to. We don't want to hang our hat on it for good. Could you use an indirect as your as your heat exchanger? So again, what we run into. Say this. Whoops, sorry guys. I'm a little excited here. Say, for argument, that this was a coil within a tank. Yeah. And right here was this, right? No, do it backwards. You could do it either way. Yeah. I would prefer it be backwards. Backwards, yeah. We're still going to have a little bit of loss, depending, right? Yeah. So what, um, Stephen, right? Yeah. All right, so what Stephen was mentioning is, right, if we had a, a tank uh, inside here, we would have, we could have this coil and then go back out. So that would be another way to basically have an exchange between uh, antifreeze and a non-antifreeze system. However, you have to be sure that there's enough flow and we can pick up capacity enough to handle whatever load is on the load side. If, if we had a lot, and generally speaking, most of those I've seen are much smaller. I don't think I've seen one, maybe inch and a quarter would be the biggest one that I've ever seen with that coil going inside um, and with the tappings on the outside. So if it was a small load situation, I don't think it would be a problem. If it was a big load situation, I think we would, we would run into the same thing, but on the opposite side, where that tank, this, the, our heat pump would, Pump that thing up to 125 degrees, no problem. But we can't extract that heat enough because there's not a, diff a big enough differential in the temperature. If we're looking to deliver 120, and that tank's setting at 130, we're only going to pick up a certain amount of degrees in that water by the time it gets out. Uh, just a little layout of kind of how things work, how we could have things tied together. Whether we're doing a radiant loop, uh, an air cell, right? Air cell, thumbs up. Uh, no more air cell, but uh, it was fun while it lasted. High wall fan coil unit, uh, thin wall unit, uh, regular our WCSP air handlers. Of course, we've got our chiller slash heat pump. It's basically a hydronic system. We just have a, a, a high efficiency electric boiler tied into it. Another application, how are we going to do certain things if we have multiple units, right? If we have multiple units, we got one inch tappings in and out. We're going to slowly increase the size. I know this is kind of a miserable slide, but you guys get the, get the gist of it. So we don't necessarily have to run two and a half inch the whole way, or two inch uh, manifolding the whole way. We could, but we wouldn't have to. And generally speaking, your, uh, 
they're installed in a reverse return type system. Everybody familiar with that? First one in, last one back, that kind of thing. Basically, um, it makes everything flow a little easier and keeps the flow relatively the same. You wouldn't want one unit getting more flow than another unit and uh, having issues created that way. This is the inside of that job uh, in Maine that those units ran for a couple weeks there, really cold, negative 20 temperature. Um, this is a great picture of an overbuilt boiler room. Um, it looks fantastic, but it's, you know, I wish I was the gun call salesman on this project. So, these, I'm not sure, I can't remember, I had looked them up, these pumps at one time. But those are the two pumps going to our units outside. Remember, we only need 10 to 12 GPM. Those are capable of like 30 some GPM and they're, they're fancy pumps, but it worked fantastic. You know, they, they spared no expense and it works exactly the way it's supposed to. Another, um, another project where we've got, um, <coughs> this is not our buffer tank. Uh, we only had buffer tanks start coming out a few years ago. This is a carbon steel buffer tank. But what do you notice in this chilled water application? Somebody say insulation. Yeah, insulation. insulation. So if we're gonna do chilled water and we're going to insulate our pipes, we 100% absolutely need to insulate our pipes and then we're going to look at it, and then we're going to go back and we're going to insulate some more. Now, this system looks like it's insulated, right? It is, honestly. The stem that comes out from the boiler, from the uh, ball yeah. valve, sure. it will drip like it's a faucet. Okay? No question. A little bit of insulation wrapped around it, you won't have a problem. When you do a chilled water application, if you're in a boiler room like this, two things. Close the boiler room in if you can dehumidify it with either a standalone dehumidifier, or you know what? Run some cooling in that room to help dehumidify that space, okay? There's a lot of zones here, and that's only an inch and a quarter. That one might be an inch and a half manifold, uh, but there's <laughs> GPM, 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 like a lot of flow going out of there, which, and again, everything will work as long as not everybody calls at the same time. It would just take a little longer for it to come up. Um, this was a project, Lee's seen this project. We were down on this one. Remember this one? Is that Baxter Street? No. That's, a, oh. that's the Habitat for Humanity yeah. project. So, Cleveland Avenue. Oh, yeah. here's, a, here's a project, yeah, yeah. right, that where we've got, yeah. Yeah. the sole form of heating is outside, it's our, our low ambient heat pump. Inside, we're pumping hot water into this tank. Coming oh. off of that, we have low two circulators. One circulator goes down to a radiant slab. I think the load on this whole house was like 16,000 BTUs, if I remember. It wasn't much. It wasn't much. You could have, you know, a couple of birthday candles and you would have been set. And we put some low temperature baseboard, or we, the contractor, put some low temperature baseboard upstairs. This unit runs fantastic. Okay? Sole form of heating and cooling. This has the elements wired in so that, like I had mentioned before, even if it gets a negative 20 outside, right, the heat pump. First of all, unless you tell it to shut off, the heat pump will never shut off. And it'll always try to work for you until it comes to the point where you say, you know what, you're not helping me. You're actually costing me money now because maybe I'm so cold it's below of one COP. Um, when we talk with some of the folks that design these projects through Efficiency Vermont and Habitat for Humanity, the units under 98% of their runtime are so efficient that if it runs inefficiently for two weeks out of the year, in the big picture, it's no worries. It's not worth putting in another form of heat to take up that differential. And just those two elements on that 3,000 uh, watts a piece is gonna provide about uh, 20,000 BTUs, right? So you could potentially, even if that unit shut off for some reason, you could heat the house with just those elements, okay? In the previous slide, uh, the uh, intakes, uh, Piping is sort of like, I don't know, two thirds, uh, one third down from the top. Like this picture here? Yeah. I'm not talking right here. Yeah. Because John was talking, John Sigsbell was talking about stagnation in the top part of uh, the yeah. bucket yeah. tank <coughs> yeah. and not having that uh, water available. So isn't that a problem in this one? Uh, no. I mean, I, the water moves so, so great. I mean, yeah, could you get a little bit of whatever going on up here, kind of like that, that old adage of having your tailgate up or down in your truck, right? So, the, so you're saying that some of this water up here might 
get staggered. Yeah, never get to you. It's like the, the, this so, place was a chiller, but if you're talking about stratification, uh, yeah, it's hot yeah, water, right. you never get the hot water. There, there's enough. There's enough temperature change. There's enough temperature differential where they move. You know, when we've got. You got to think we've got um, 12 GPM coming this way, or potential for 10 or 12 GPM coming that way. First thing that's going to do is coming fast, fast, fast. It's going to hit here. And it's going to open right up until it has a room. That's going to open up, and then it's going to work down here. With I would see that to be a problem on very large uh, buffer tanks. I do not see that to be a problem on small buffer tanks. You know, because even even so, if we cut this line anywhere here, right, and we said, you know, we're not getting any temperature above this line, well, all this temperature is, is hot or cold, they're touching each other. You know what I mean? We're, we're going to get some heat transfer one way or the other. Um, we have also taken uh, temperatures above on the top of the tank and at the bottom of the tank, and there's very little differential, you know, a degree or two maybe. So you made a point to insulate, but those weren't insulated. This is a heating only application. So you don't care. Don't care. Heating only application, they got window shaders. So on a heating only application, we don't have to worry about any kind of heat. You know, if you wanted to, you could, right? If there's a little bit of ambient loss there, but uh, in this application, I'm assuming it was much cooler. Uh, we'll leave it like that. Another project here, uh, chilled water system. Lots and lots of insulation. What do you see down here? Yeah. Drip, 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 right? So it looks real cool. Um, if you ever do a really nice chilled water, you'll take pictures before you put the insulation on. Okay, another nice application. Uh, insulation. Sure it's cool. it's This was the last project that I did as a contractor. This is that long house again. But um, just to kind of give you a layout of how it works, we've got our buffer tank over there, and these two circulators go to the, the, the chillers that are outside. There's a check valve in that circulator. There's a check valve right there. This boiler also has a circulator that comes off and goes to an indirect water heater. So this system could be running here and cooling also heating that domestic hot water with the same water at the same time. If it's in a heating application and we need to, uh, the, the chillers won't keep up, this circulator turns on, this boiler comes over here and dumps water right in there and heats that buffer tank up. The other thing that this does at the same time, now I should go back and take a different picture, is a gigantic plate heat exchanger on these inch and a quarter lines, which is a heater for their pool. Right? Like the biggest plate heat exchanger I've ever seen in my whole entire life. Gigantic. So there's not much that can't be done. See that nice installation on the drain there? Heat trap? You had somebody do that for you? I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I got I got my chops busted because I painted the legs on the stand, but I didn't use pressure treated four by fours. The building inspector, that's what he picked me apart on. Yeah, it's like anytime you touch concrete, you're supposed to use treated lumber. Yeah, that's the code they changed. Huh? They changed that to a code. Yeah. So, uh, and this was years ago. I'm like, okay, what do you want me to do about it? Well, don't let it happen again. I'm like, okay. Anything else? No, I don't understand any of this. <laughs> Have a good day. So, a uh, couple of the funny things that we get to see on occasion. Um, I. I'm gonna make kind of like a little more of a blooper reel, but every now and then you accidentally <laughs> put put a project up on a on a job before, and the contractor who did it was actually in the room, and <laughs> I didn't think about it until it actually happened, and I see the gentleman in the back and he's kind of like <laughs> down in the seat with that, but needless to say he'll never make those mistakes ever again, right? Um, so in this application, this is just a four pipe buffer tank that was set on its side. Unfortunately, destined for failure, um, there was a system that he had panel radiators all over the house. Never gets hot, never gets hot, never gets hot. But we don't have enough flow, right? Because even some of those panel radiators, the large ones, they need flow. They need GPM. You know, the circulator that we have here that they had, it's, it's not enough. It's not going to cut the mustard. When I show you the next picture, well, this one works great. 
Well, this one works great, and you can't really see it because he took it off the very end of, uh, of the manifold. So that one's basically getting full flow all the time. All these other ones, right, even if they, how many GPM is a, a Grunfall South Pump going to do? Maybe 13 on its best day downhill with the wind at its back, right? It's not going to do much more than that. And every one of those need it. So we got to make sure that, that things are sized properly. This was the one we were talking about. So uh, this was a project in Hudson, um, 15 minutes from my house. I did not bid on this as a contractor. This is one of my other, uh, Kenny, uh, my former boss, a former national sales manager, was like, Jim, can you go look at this? I'm not telling you that you have to fix it, but boy, it would help us out if you fixed it. So I went and looked at it, and I was like, yeah, I'm not fixing it. <laughs> so basically, with this, this still to this day exists with a, with a wall built around it. We didn't have enough flow, so we put another circulator in line. Then we had too much weight, so we had to use a, a ratchet strap and tie it up from the, from the truck, right? So this person, this contractor, didn't ask questions, right? It takes very few jobs like this for like a company like ours, Space Pack, to get dubbed as junk. Okay, we want nothing more than your first installation and your first installation of chiller stuff or any project to go as smooth as possible. That's the point, right? You could do 10 million things right in a year, and the three things that you do wrong, like right on a blackboard with a red marker, is what everybody's going to talk about for days and weeks and months to come, right? Don't hesitate to ask. This is that SSID control I was talking about. We could have the inputs from five air handlers come in here, uh, whether it be from our, uh, our high wall, our thin wall, our air handlers themselves. Uh, and we're going to have outputs too. We have a water temperature sensor for our buffer tank. We have a temperature sensor for outside, so we can turn on and off our units uh, based on outside ambient temperature. Uh, we can turn on our heat pump and heating or cooling mode and all those changes we can set our uh, set points for our buffer tank excuse me in there as well and we have some parameter settings like there was a job we did in Vermont St. John's Barry Vermont that the house was had so much solar gain they needed cooling in the wintertime they absolutely needed cooling in the wintertime so we made some adjustments and when I, I say it's because the firmware is, is USB upgradable and since, as we mentioned before about our board, we build that in-house, so to speak, in that building right over there. and It's controlled uh, and designed by uh, engineers in that building over there. So I went to him and I said, listen, we need to open up some of the parameters on this because I know that our unit will make cool, uh, it'll make cold water at negative 20, but we, our control won't allow it. Oh, no problem. It's not something we're going to open up for everybody because you could get into a little bit of trouble if you press the button too many times. But knowing that this was the application for it, I called uh, Kevin Smart, who's our engineer in this department that handles this product, changed the, uh, updated the firmware, gave me a USB, I went up there, changed the program, and now the unit will run down to uh, 20 degrees below zero, safely. Right? So we're flexible like that. Again, we want it to work, you know, and each, we know that uh, any space back system is never really seems to be a cut and dry system. It's always easier to ask a question first and to try to explain your way out of it later, right? Especially when I haven't given you all my numbers yet, but, uh, but I will if, uh, if you want. And then the segue to that is that you can call me and most of the time I will absolutely answer except for like on a day like today. I will, however, probably hang up if you ask me a question that can be found in a piece of paperwork that you have today, right? So just spend some time going through that. You can see here we've got our inputs, which are basically a heating and a cooling call and a common. We have water temperature sensors, we have return water temperature sensors, we have an air temperature, outside air. We have room um, to expand this. Our, our plan is to have to allow, right now we can do a chiller and a boiler. I want to uh, expand it a little bit more. We can do a chiller and a boiler and a solar tank. So depending on what is what, we can, we can uh, take from the most efficient form of energy that we're making at any time. Kind of shows you a little layout on the here in the air cell making another row of appearance. Again, we've got our pre-sale support, right? Pre-sale support is space back in our technical service. Um, do we have any questions on this? What we're gonna do is take a few minute break. Um, we can ask questions and then we'll go out into the lab area and we'll turn those heat pumps on so we can, we can watch them work. We can see how they ramp up, ramp down, cool the tank, blow the cool air, blow the warm air. 
that kind of stuff, right? 